Thank you, Jens, and good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Uh, just to explain, we will have two panels. The first panel that will report on uh, the outcomes of the uh, strategy labs, and then we'll have a second panel where we will hear from perspective from uh, different actors, who specifically we'll hear from the private sector and, and youth uh, perspective. So just to explain, because it's not necessarily very clear in the agenda. So. Um, for this session, we'll he be hearing about the outcomes of the Strategy Lab, and for that, I'll call by their name, not full name, it's, it's easier, clear. Uh, I would like to call uh, Phil to come uh, to join us. Um, then uh, Simon. Yes, please, here. Uh, Rodrigo, Katerina, and Robert. The way we, uh, we have prepared the session is that uh, we will give the floor to each of the uh, moderators uh, and people who led the, uh, the strategy labs to share with us the key uh, outcomes from uh, the, these, uh, the labs and, and the key uh, message that we would like to take. Three minutes each. Without delay, we are starting with Phil. Please, Phil. Thank you very much, Borheen. Um, the Strategy Lab session focused on diversifying financial investment in TVET, recognised uh, the challenges and urgency of ensuring expanded and ongoing funding of TVET systems worldwide, convincing the full range of stakeholders to invest in TVET, including enterprises and individuals, in addition to governments, is paramount. The economic impact of training is often evidenced. However, the social aspects, including the societies and communities, is often not systematically integrated into the equation. Using information explaining the returns to investment in TVET for the different stakeholders through ROI studies can help make the case for TVET. The examples and tools that were presented at the Strategy Lab provide a valuable framework. However, they need to be scalable and recognise that returns to TVET differ markedly, and these broad models need to respect that. And looking critically at innovative TVET funding models and their application in countries with similar characteristics through sharing of experience will go a long way to ensuring that TVET isn't constrained by very traditional models but enhanced by new ones. So the key recommendations arising from uh, Strategy uh, Lab 1 were that TVET is a fertile ground to develop new models of investment but the benefits and impact need to be supported by hard evidence to guide decision making and encourage multi-level participation. In this, TVET authorities are encouraged to carry out analyses of costs and benefits, build capacities in data collection and establish norms for data sharing with different stakeholders, including the informal sector. Secondly, the TVET community should continue to develop and share case examples to encourage TVET ministries and funders to find the right models or mechanisms to mobilise appropriate levels of funding and the analysis of long-term long benefits and support. Um, the analysis of long-term benefits um, need to be um, supported by scale-up or model transfer and the group felt that the Univoc network has an essential and important role to play in this dissemination. And very finally, I bring to your attention that there are tools for better understanding things such as costs, benefits and returns to TVET, and a practical guide to ROI will be published this year in September through the Univoc network. And flyers are apparently available in the display space uh, outside the meeting room. So in conclusion, financing uh, in many respects is actually a cross-cutting element to address some of the disruptions that we have discussed at the conference over the last two days. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Money talks, so we need to be careful with money and uh, the cost-benefit. Yeah, but uh, I think uh, I take also this importance of the return, not only economic return, but also social return, yeah. and that the outcome is not only labor market outcome, it can be also social outcome. Okay. Uh, Simon? Thank you, Bohan. Um, so Strategy Lab 2 was looking at the issue of migration. So I have been a, migra a migrant. My parents were migrants. Most people in that room had direct experience of migration. It's not just something that's out there. Um, and of course, it's a universal phenomenon. It affects all regions. It's happened throughout our history. We wouldn't be here in Germany if we hadn't migrated out of Africa. So, you know, it's important to remember this is not just something special that's happened in the last couple of years just because it's happening in Europe. It's something that is much wider. 
Um, you know, we talked about conceptual issues and practical examples. Some of the contexts that w we discussed were Zimbabwe migrants in South Africa and Britain, uh, Filipinas in Hong Kong, in the Middle East. Um, migrants, of course, moving into Europe, but also, you know, that Bangladesh is currently a major site of, of refugees, that Kenya, for more than a couple of decades, has had very large Lots of the countries involved have lots of these experiences. New countries that haven't experienced migration in recent years, um, in much, much scale, now seeing this, of Peru, Chile, the sort of Peruvians to Chile, migrants in Brazil, etc. So lots of different aspects of this. And of course, this is partly an important message here. Migration is complex. There are multiple reasons for it. Those vary across countries. They vary across individuals. And often, there's not one single explanation that an individual really believes. And of course, when they come up against states, which are often hostile, they often give the answer that they think is the best answer to give. So the realities are, are complex. And so we can't come up with simple messages of do these things. What we can do, however, once we, we acknowledge that diversity and complexity, at the macro level, clearly some of the work around regional and bilateral recognition of qualifications. So RQFs, yes, but also conversation between those RQFs and some of the work that was highlighted this morning by Sarah around um, the Philippines' experience of engaging with the countries that migrants are in to see how you can look at the certification process. But of course, part of, part of migration for many people is because of a gradient, a gradient of economic opportunity, a gradient of education. The, sh the sharper that gradient is, the more likely migration is to happen. So addressing educational opportunity and economic opportunity in sending countries clearly is part of the story. And that needs to be part of this perspective for development. At level of, of systems institutions, clearly we can't think in the same old ways. And we have to find new ways of working, new partnerships. There are lots of experiences out there across the network and beyond that we can learn from. But as I say, those won't be in simple blueprints, but it will be learning from those experiences to think what might work in our experiences. Clearly, there are challenges around language, around psychosocial support, a range of issues that are relatively unfamiliar for many vocational institutions, which put new stresses on them in terms of the quality of staff training and other resources to support these things. And of course, teachers need to be supported with, to engage with curriculum pedagogical change. However, I think you know, w one thing I was reflecting on from this, sitting in, a, sitting in a, an elite university, international students are good because they bring lots of income in, in the VET system, migrants are seen as bad because they're a problem. But actually, the curricular challenges, the pedagogical challenges, many of the challenges are pretty similar. You know, what happens in the UK if in one university, as is the case, 98% of the students in one subject are Chinese? That clearly has implications for teaching and learning. It has to have. So we need to think about this you know, across the sector and not just as a migration problem, bad, but it's actually a migration problem much more complex than that. Um, so we need to support teachers. Uh, for the network, you know, we started this process. Clearly, there's more to do to understand the issues here and just the opportunity to share yesterday and today. I've, I've certainly deepened my understanding of these issues, and I'm sure that's the case for others. So there's a, a space going forward for, from here to be communicating, to be learning together, and then to move towards some kind of guidance, which I think is a way of thinking through rather than a, a list of things to do. And that's what we hope to move towards. Thank you, Bohan. Thank you, Simon. So uh, an assignment for the network? Yes. 
uh, I think the, uh, the actors, and particularly this focus on teachers, has been uh, underestimated or, or uh, has not been under the radar. We, we focus more on the certification, uh, on legislation, etc., but, but much less on, on teachers. Uh, and obviously, this variable geometry of uh, migration uh, south-north, but also south-south, and, and uh, uh, the diversity. And also, I think one point that uh, came from the discussion yesterday is this blurring uh, called frontier between sending, receiving, and transition countries. Some sendings are also receiving. Uh, receiving are also sending, and the ones who are in transition are uh, being, uh, becoming also receiving or, or sending. So th that, that geometry means that there is a, a need at a global level to, um, to take this into consideration. Um, at the UN, we have a, a UN uh, global compact on, on migration that will be adopted most probably this summer or, uh, or late this year, and that's uh, uh, highlighted a bit also the attention at international level. Thank you, Simon. Buenas tardes, Rodrigo. Uh, we would like to hear from you uh, from the Strategy Lab that you have moderated, please. Thanks to everyone. Thanks for the invitation. Do you remember the picture of the fish jumping? The fish who is looking for better conditions, uh, try to uh, improve, uh, taking risk, and trying to do something different. Uh, I could say that he's an entrepreneur. Uh, it fits, have, has the mentality of an entrepreneur. Um, if we think in that, if, we, if he do, if it's, it's do that in the real world, probably, and uh, it failed, probably will die. Uh, but if the fish do that in a better condition, in a contained condition, uh, and he can practice that, probably uh, he could fail, but probably uh, the fish will uh, understand how to do it better and probably success in the future. And probably if we know the method of that, uh, or the other fishes, fish uh, know the method, probably could help the others to jump again and improve the better conditions. Um, in a time of dis disruptions, a traditional way of teaching and learning in the education system is no longer sufficient. Entrepreneurial education helps young people to adapt to these disruptions, uh, to cope with any challenge in life to create value. In another part, in an entrepreneurial education, it is crucial to help the student to experience and to learn from experience, uh, including failures. That is very important. And to develop entrepreneurial mindset and values, which is not limited to knowledge about entrepreneurship and how to start a business, not only that. Um, we need to invest more uh, in teacher training to develop entre entrepreneurial culture. All Tibet teachers, um, regardless uh, of their disciplines, must have entrepreneurial mindset. At the same time, Tibet schools have to be open to mobilize and bring in partners from the community and the business world, for example, to inspire and to serve as a mentor. Thank you, Rodrigo. That's, uh, that's very clear. Uh, if I can pick up th three points from what you are saying. First of all, uh, this more expanded uh, understanding of entrepreneurship, uh, meaning not only doing business, but it's also entrepreneurial attitude and, and, and engagement. I think that's an important aspect. Also, taking uh, the teaching staff as a broader set of, of functions, not only teachers, but also the broader teaching staff. And the last point I think is very important is the, what ecosystem can uh, be a, a conducive environment for entrepreneurial learning, and obviously how to make Tibet institutions a conducive environment for entrepreneurial learning is, is one important aspect. Thank you. Uh, Pierre-Luc, je vous en prie. Merci. You've got the floor. Thank you. I uh, worked on session three. Uh, our session was titled uh, Emerging Models for TVET to Meet Demands of Green Jobs and Enhance Local Actions. Uh, the goal of our session was to establish links between community engagement and greening TVET. Uh, but before listing our recommendations, I would like to thank all the participants of our sessions. And I would also, uh, also like to send a special thank to Abdi Tioni 
from the Rift Valley Technical Training Institute in Kenya, who also presented a project on greening TVET during our session. So we have three recommendations. The first one is on uh, awareness raising. The sec second one is on greening as a soft skill. And the third one is about empowerment. So I'll read the recommendations for you. Uh, the first um, recommendation says uh, raising awareness among all stakeholders is key. TVET institutions should play a leading role in promoting the SDGs and TVET's contribution to sustainable development and involve the local community in doing so. Uh, for the Univoc network, each Univoc center should include an awareness raising campaign in their biennial work plan. Uh, the second recommendation on greening, on greening reads, uh, knowledge for sustainability and promoting a green culture are fundamental to the transition towards green societies and economies. Greening should be recognized and included as a soft skill in the curriculum. And the third recommendation on empowerment, more emphasis should be put on the role of teachers in greening TVET and their capacity building needs. Similarly, there should be more discussion on the support mechanisms needed to enhance student involvement and empower them to take part in, uh, for example, uh, applied research. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre-Luc. Shemal, you organize the conference and you go home with the homework. You have, a, you have to support all the, the network in raising awareness, and uh, the, the team has come out with a kind of clear action plan for you, so uh, please take that on, on board. Um, I think the point on the um, uh, green culture, green skills as part also of the soft skill and the set of skills is, is an important aspect, how we distinguish between, um, call it, element of fundamental skills that is needed to uh, change the lifestyle, to change uh, our mindset about the environment, but then green skills as job-specific skills that is needed in specific jobs. Uh, it's, it's important that we make this distinction, but also that we understand how these skills can be developed. And, and obviously, uh, again, the teaching staff and, and, and the supporting environment is very important. Thank you. Thank you, PM. Uh, Katerina? So um, in our strategy lab this morning, we discussed the issue of learning pathways and articulation between TVET and higher education. Um, we discussed more specifically the obstacles related to the development and, and implementation of effective learning pathways. And not so much the obstacles, but mostly the tools uh, and the measures that have been used and have been put in place in different contexts in different countries to address some of these obstacles. Um, and then in also related to this issue of pathways and links, we also discussed the, um, the, how, how TVET has been changing in recent years, both in terms of expansion, in terms of the, the increase in the number of programs available, but also, um, more importantly, perhaps in terms of the diversity um, uh, that is in terms of the different types of um, of institutions and programs that are increasingly available in, in different countries. And we heard particularly um, about the European experiences in, in this um, uh, domain of diversification. Um, and I think that that's relates to, this, to the first key message. I wouldn't use the word recommendation at this point yet. I'm not sure that we reached recommendations, but um, one of the, the topics, one of the points that came out um, very prominently during the discussions was this issue of the blurring of boundaries between TVET and general education, including higher education, which is also driven and perhaps reflects to some extent the changing world of work and all the disruptions that we've been talking about in, in the last two days and the, the change in demand for skills and so on. Um, another second uh, point, which again relates to the diversification, which can also produce or create fragmentation in the system, is that of transparency and how, uh, what tools can be put in place to help to improve the transparency of uh, increasingly diverse systems, um, and also therefore to b promote effective pathways for, for further learning. Um, and we discussed some of these tools uh, in some more detail, including, for example, the uh, national qualification frameworks, uh, career guidance, and so on. And then thirdly, one third point that I would just like to flag here is um, um, we talked about uh, how it is important to design in order to, to enable uh, um, students with TVET backgrounds to, 
to progress further, to, to engage in further learning, uh, how it is important not just to remove, to look at barriers to access to further learning, but also to ensure that programs have built in them the, um, um, a, a sufficient range of skills and knowledge that can support lifelong learning. So how um, they can provide uh, support to students to be able not just to access further learning, but also to, to successfully uh, complete it. Thank you, Katrina. So uh, Steve said that uh, links to the labor market but can enable lifelong learning. I think that's, that's an important message. And for that, uh, we need more transparency and, and tools that can support this, uh, this progression and obviously uh, lowering down the barriers that are uh, put in the, for uh, Tibet's graduates in particular. Thank you. We move to uh, Robert. Uh, we, uh, we are closing the panel with open learning. <laughs> and Robert will speak about open learning, please. No, I'm not speaking about open learning, actually. Um, <laughs> All the is about open learning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our panel uh, was about uh, the, the, um, preparing the teacher for the digital uh, future. And uh, we started up with, uh, uh, with, with three inspirational cases uh, coming from Canada, the Philippines and Paraguay. Uh, uh, where actions and specific uh, uh, implementations were done to, uh, to address this, this issue. And in the discussion uh, which was uh, following these, uh, these presentations, uh, there already came mentioning of the differences, the, the large differences between the global south and the opportunities over there and the global north and the opportunities over there, especially when you're talking about digital uh, uh, opportunities uh, for your education, uh, the, the, well, the, the, the simple lack of bandwidth, uh, which, is, uh, which is hindering a lot of things which are able here, but which are not uh, uh, possible over there. Um, the, uh, actually, a teacher, as, as, uh, in this case, uh, he should know what about technology, but he should also know how about technologies, and at the, at the same time, he or she should know to teach with technologies, so using uh, technology in, in, uh, in the teaching practice, but also know the, uh, how to teach about technologies. So teaching with technologies and teaching about technologies are two uh, different things, and the teacher should be able to do both. So there is a lot of professionalization needed for teachers to, uh, uh, um, to come, become uh, on par for this. Um, man, one one uh, mentioning was that uh, there, uh, there is a role for large companies and most even uh, countries. Uh, there was an uh, example brought in by one of the uh, participants where China, and uh, this, this guy talked about turnkey solutions, uh, which is delivered by China in Africa. For instance, uh, in, uh, in Dar es Salaam, a whole uh, port is being built by the Chinese, including a complete TVET institution to, uh, to give the, uh, the people the, 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 the necessary education and skills development to be able to be part, uh, to be working in this area. This raises the question, what is the role of a TVET institution in this, uh, in this whole, and especially also the role of the regulations? And it was also pointed out that in most cases not the local community was, uh, uh, was profiting from them, but the Chinese themselves. The Chinese were flown in and they did the jobs and not the local community. So there's those, those are developments which we should uh, take into account when we are thinking about measurements for... Um, uh, improving and preparing teachers for the digital future. We came up with a couple of actions and uh, recommendations. First is that actions are needed both on all levels, both on policy level to secure, for instance, uh, the, 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 the opportunity to raise awareness to support teachers in, uh, in their endeavor, but also on small skills, small activities, small programs, specifically targeted at teachers. So both measures are, uh, are necessary, not only the small things, but also the, the, the larger skill efforts, 
uh, actions on policy level to, uh, to, to secure all this. The second is collaboration on all levels is needed. This isn't something an individual teacher or an individual institution or even an individual country can solve. It, it, uh, it needs collaboration on all levels to address this topic. And the third one is there are a lot of good practices available. And we found out in, 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 in our class, that, that if in our uh, the, uh, lab, that, that we weren't even aware of each other's but, uh, each other good practices. So we need to exchange more these good practices. There, there, uh, and, and I think maybe Unifoc can play a, a good role in this. So those were actually the, the, the main findings and main recommendations. Thank you, Rob, for that. I think we, we take this twofold uh, movement for teachers teaching about uh, technology, but also teaching with technology. I think this is uh, an important aspect, and uh, uh, the, the collaborative framework is, is uh, again, uh, uh, very important to highlight, and again, the network. Um, maybe we, we will uh, finish this panel, but I think one important aspect that's coming from our discussion is that um, we, even when we start at the, at the broader system level, it boils down to the delivery point and about teachers and their role and the teaching staff. And I think this is something that is very important uh, to take into consideration, both in terms of the outcome of our um, conference, but also the action that uh, Univoc can take. Thank you to the panelists and for the reporting. Uh, we recorded uh, the outcomes, the suggestions, the action plan, the recommendations, and uh, we hope we'll uh, take that forward uh, in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. With this, we, uh, we are moving to uh, another panel. And uh, uh, I think that the... Uh, the importance of this panel is that we, we, are, we will hear uh, from um, actors who are not necessarily always uh, present in the discussion, but also their voice is not always uh, uh, heard. And I think uh, one uh, is, of course, youth and youth representative, but also the private sector. We tend to, when we organize conferences, we, uh, we tend to have government officials, but much less private sector. And when we invite the uh, government to nominate private sector, we get government representative. So if we have a chance to have a, a private sector participant, to have youth voice, I think it will be uh, a, a very good uh, way. Uh, it's the, uh, the strawberry on the, on the cake. This is a translation from French. So, <laughs> or cherry, yeah, better than cherry. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. I was thinking about the, the strawberry. Uh, that's, that's, that's not a cake? <laughs> that's short cake, yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, of course, we, uh, we invite uh, the big boss to, to join us in, in this panel, uh, Shaimal Majumdar. But uh, then uh, I would like to invite uh, here uh, Mr. Olivier Charles uh, Ousseau uh, from the um, Federation of the Small and Medium Enterprises in, um, in Côte d'Ivoire. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Jacqueline uh, Tanzel from uh, the uh, World Skills uh, Champions Trust representative for Europe, and uh, then we have the chance also to have a youth uh, sector representative, uh, Maria uh, Budik, who is student and intern uh, in, uh, from Minerva Schools at uh, KGI, Clean Energy Associates. Okay, uh, this panel, we, we wanted to uh, organize it around two moments. The first moment would be more uh, the perspective of the panelists uh, regarding the, uh, the discussion we had and, and the takeaway that they are having from their individual perspective. But then the second um, moment would be more to have their perspective as stakeholders and uh, as actors. So we will start with, first of all, uh, their perspective as uh, individuals, and uh, we would like to hear from them uh, from their own perspective how Tibet systems as a whole will need to change to overcome and respond to the disruption. Uh, we started with three disruption, but then thanks to Caroline, we are ending with another one, uh, a fourth disruption uh, regarding gender. But uh, obviously, we would like to hear from them what, what is their views on, based on the discussion, but also on their perspective. And uh, for that, 
uh, we, uh, we will start first of all uh, by uh, the representative of the private sector I'm making a distor distortion to the uh, agenda here. But I would like to give the floor to uh, Charles. Uh, Charles, uh, nous voulons avoir votre avis. So we would like to have your opinion and see how do you see the change as employer, as individual, and in how far do um, TVET systems respond to this problem? Thank you. So we have heard so many things ever since we've arrived and the conference started, the um, disruptions um, that we've addressed here, addressed here. Of course, we had an idea in the past to overcome them, but now we have a more profound idea meaning that uh, we have uh, uh, demographic, climatic and economic disruptions everywhere, but there are some variations. And we realize that in um, the Western countries, you uh, have migration from all over the world. And uh, on contrast, in our case, we have more young people who are not always well trained and who are looking for some uh, good work going um, over the ocean, thinking they find a paradise. And on the other side, uh, in the Western countries, we have an aging population. And uh, for me, if you want to have my personal perspective, I can say that a cooperation or some exchange on international level is more than necessary because it's true. We're facing the same challenges, but these challenges um, uh, depend on the different situations. Uh, the demographic challenges are different in Africa than in Europe. And for us, it would be good to have a cooperation that is straightforward um, with the um, support of small and medium-sized uh, enterprises for our young people who are not well trained. And we have so many of them. And you have more aging societies and you need some solutions in order to face the challenges that you're confronted with. That's what I'd like to say uh, for the time being. Thank you. I think this detail um, underlines the importance of the difference of challenges that we're facing, uh, meaning the demographic challenge is one important one and um, also uh, the lack of um, training or, let's say, further training that might be necessary. And what is your own perspective on this? Thank you. So, thank you, and um, good afternoon. And um, I would just like to introduce myself. Um, I'm here on behalf of World Skills, and I'm part of a group of nine past competitors or champions, as we call them. It's called the World Skills Champions Trust, and we represent the youth voice within this organisation, and hopefully within the dialogue that is going on around TVET. So we've heard a lot about disruption in the last two days, and I want to give you my perspective on it from the view of a young person and a world skills champion. Because a competition is actually a disruptive situation. You make competitors um, face a situation and show their best performances, whilst they have the pressure while they have an unfamiliar environment and a task they've never seen before. And although your training focuses on vocational skills, you can't do a competition without social skills. I've gone through this preparation and through the competition itself. And what you need throughout that whole process um, is motivation, creative thinking, problem solving, flexibility, timing, communi communication, teamwork, and I could go on. And those are all soft skills. And those soft skills are hard to teach in a traditional classroom, but there are ways to further them. And in the end, it's those skills which determine your success of competing. And when I speak of success, I, I don't speak about winning a medal, because I did not win a medal. I competed in EuroSkills 2014, and I came fifth. And then I competed at the WorldSkills 2015, and I came fifth.
But that experience completely changed who I am and who I want to be and what I value and how I work and how I learn. So for me, the success of competing is to get all these skills and the knowledge out of it. So I would say soft skills are in these days much more important and much more valued than hard skills. So we have in TIVA to focus on these as well. And we should never forget that we are living in a time um, where lifelong learning became obligatory. We can't be stuck in tried and trusted systems anymore. It's just not possible. We need to embrace the progression and the development of technology and the contribution it has made to the change of the workplace. And we have to keep evolving and adapting our TVET systems. Thank you, Jacqueline. That's very clear. I think the emphasis on the soft skills. Uh, uh, fifth is very uh, good number in my culture. <laughs> we have five pillars of the religion. When we want to protect from the jealousy, we put the five fingers. So keep well with, with the fifth. I think that's very good. Mary, Maria, what is your own perspective? Um, yeah, thank you. So just a bit of background as well. Um, so I come from a very kind of highly academic setting, so I followed the German educational system until 10th grade, um, then went to an international school, um, and I'm now enrolled in, at university studying international relations. Um, so I think representing to you the youth, especially coming from that academic background, um, it's really important to stress that we need to change the mindset um, that people have when it comes to TVET. Um, so I think at the, at the moment, just talking um, to other stakeholders from my group, the mindset is really that um, TVET is something um, that you do when you fail to fit into the system, when you failed um, to kind of be in that academic setting. And I think especially in light of those disruptions that we are facing, that our current society is facing, um, it's important to stress that TVET um, shouldn't overcome them, but instead really sh show that TVET is the way to kind of use um, to kind of respond to those disruptions. Um, and I think especially thinking about how um, UNESCO defines TVET being lifelong, relevant, um, as well as equitable, um, TVET is really, at this point, the only way in which we can ensure that our youth and that future generations will be able to respond to those disruptions um, and in a way really fit into the job market and survive. Um, and I think the way to really change that mindset of people, um, of the youth, um, we need to integrate vocational education and training into um, the academic setting, um, either thinking about having it um, at a very early stage in people's education or having it at a university um, level. So speaking from um, my personal experience, um, since I went to German school, it was mandatory for me to do an internship um, in 10th grade. And I think it's mandatory for a lot of people in German schools to actually have that internship, which really exposes people to the world of work. Um, and then now at my university, um, we have a four-month period in which we can actually do an internship as well. Um, so just shifting academics to being purely academic um, to something that also connects the job world of work um, is something that's really necessary. So instead of seeing it as something it's either academics or TVET, we should more think of, this, think of it as something that um, you can combine both of these things. Um, and I think another way is really to make um, people more interested in TVET by actually, for example, if universities were to build partnerships with outside organizations, or even if TVET institutions were to build partnerships with other um, companies, I think that would be a way to really make it more attractive. Um, and I think that's especially responding to the shifts in demographics and the high mobility that we're facing nowadays. Um, I think that people, people want to travel, people want to see the world, especially young people nowadays. Um, and by having those sort of partnerships, um, TVET institutions and other organizations, or universities and other organizations, that's going to enable people to enroll in TVET and go abroad. And I think that's just something that's really um, going to make it more attractive and more relevant for people these days. 
Um, and the last thing, I think that also came up a lot of times during this conference, is really that we need to um, see TVET as something, or in general, our whole education system as something that isn't a thing that people should fit in, but instead we should think of it as something that's, that should be tailored to the individual. Um, so youth, especially nowadays, we need career guidance. Um, with a heightened mobility, with all these disruptions that we are facing, many times we find ourselves in front of too many decisions and really providing people with that clear career guidance um, is going to give them an idea of what they want and it's also going to make it really, as I've said before, be tailored to the individual, thinking about maybe um, the family, where you come from, what your traditions are, um, also what your personal aspirations in life are, what maybe your finances are, what your financial situation looks like, um, and just in general, your character. Are you more of an independent person or do you like to follow structures? So I think that's, those are the three key um, recommendations for TVET, I think, to respond to that negative mindset many people have at the moment. Thank you, Marie, and, and thank you also for referring to this uh, intercultural dimension as well that is uh, very important uh, in uh, times of, of populism and uh, violent extremism. You are making uh, Srinivas very happy today, speaking about work-based learning, and ILO will, will be very happy with us, go home, we'll, we'll celebrate UNESCO's uh, uh, work-based learning discussion. <laughs> so, but I think the, the point on work-based learning and exposure to the workplace is very important because that's how you create and you suscitate vocations and you, you uh, open opportunities for people beyond uh, the dual system, but more using the workplace as opportunity also to understand the world of work, understand opportunities seems to me very important. Shaman, you are a wise man, you, are, uh, you have a very long experience. We don't want to hear from uh, the head of UNIVOC only, but we would like to hear also from Shaimal Majumdar, Professor Shaimal Majumdar, about what is your perspective on uh, where we are going with the TVET system and what uh, has to change. Last two days, I was deeply engaged all the time thinking that what exactly, uh, we, if uh, anybody asked me that regarding the disruption, what are the changes or response need, need to be done? What I will say, it's not my word. I have learned from you last two days a lot, and I try to reflect upon that, and I was thinking sometimes the word disruption make disturbed. This is true. That's why positive disruption, negative disruption, a lot of things are coming. But Allow me to share one simple metaphor or analogy to get a very simple way how we can understand this. I like to compare with a water disruption in a locality and then see the Tibet system disruption, how they have to map. In the event of water disruption, if there is an announcement that next week, Monday, 12 to 3 or 4 o'clock, there will be no water in your locality. Then what you will do? You immediately prepare after seven days that, oh, that day water will not be there, let's store the water. And whatever store box will be there, you have been filled up, and then you can call some of your friend, if I require a little bit more water, I will contact you. So first thing was, Keep informed. Second thing, you prepare after getting the information. Third, you will allocate water wisely. You will tell your children and all family members, don't use water unnecessary. There will be no water on Monday. That means reduce water in an unnecessary sense. Then finally, if the problem occurs time and again, what you will suggest? I think we need to make a long-term plan. You know, pumps is not working. This municipality water supply has a problem. You will bother your family. It is impossible to stay if we have to find a solution now. So these are four simple steps. Inform, prepare, allocate water wisely, and make a long-term plan. Now come to the skill. If I ask you, something will be disturbed, like, you know, the way, positive, negative, then the first thing will be, 
What do you like to know as a policy maker and others, being a person, individual? I will say, what is the anticipation of skill? What going to be changed? Do you have any information? Can you help me? What going to be changed within five years and ten years? So that's one focus. That informed is here, little tough, means to get the information, you have to have an anticipation of skill. Then you have to plan. If I know something is going to happen, what are you going to do? As rightly pointed out somebody, it is a normal routine of an institution. If it is a normal routine, there is no disruption. But disruption comes because suddenly it comes to you, which was unnoticed. I will come to the point why it is unnoticed and it came suddenly if not prepared. Then second case we will do what? You will prepare. What you will prepare here? Review your curriculum, qualification, whether it is going to your requirement with the anticipation of the skill. Third thing what you will do? You will allocate your resources wisely. Who is your resources? You are talking of demographic change, lot of young people are going, this is your asset. And if you want to use that asset wisely, do you have any plan, uh, planning of training program? Upskilling program? Are you doing any reskilling program? And finally, okay, do you know that after seven years, say some prediction say that Industry 4.0 will do that, will happen, I don't know whether it will happen or not, but something definitely is coming up, it is evidence. So what is the long-term plan of yours? How we are going to do the development strategies, not for immediate jobs, but the careers and the long-term projections? For me, these are the simple four steps we need to take. And to do that, there are some conceptual understanding need to be clear. I think what is the conceptual? You have said all. I think Borin has particularly referred in the presentation, which really I think that's very important. You know, we have to see skill development as a part of greater human resource development and to achieve sustainable goal. And we have know that Borin has said very clear, clearly all the 17 goals directly or indirectly need skill to perform. So it's a bigger agenda. So we cannot work in silos. If you are working, we are not achieved. And what do you mean by not silos? This is an interconnected problem. You are creating job, you are training people. What do you do if the employment is not being generated? After training, what they will do? They will be unemployed because you are not coordinating with the economic actor. Neither you are making any plan with the you know, local ecosystem to do. So this age, you cannot work in a silo. You need to be part of a bigger, like a interconnected problem, the collective response on that. So on that, local ecosystem will play a very important role. Sometimes we are emphasizing too much on private, private sector. In some countries I know is a community. They are larger, non-formal, informal sectors are there. So that's the ecosystem we need to, social actors and others. Second, I think, when you are talking of any three disruption you are talking about, digitization, migration, lab, lab, migration, digitization, and greening, do you think that it has generated through Tibet system? No. It came outside. So we have to start thinking not only sectorial way, we need to think in a, what it is affecting means we have a very clear idea of macro level changes. I think that's also second learning to me. We need to be very, very concrete about that. Third one, Tibet must embrace innovation, which is not monopoly of university. Innovation at the Tibet level is necessary because technology is changing so fast. Even commissioning, servicing, repairing, supervising, diagnostic skill, all are coming in a very, very big way in the Tibet sectors. And a lot of reforms are also going. So to me, there should be a mix of skill. 
here gets the complication. I get fully agree with you. What you said is that the mix is one side foundation skill, which can, which give you confidence to change learning to learn skill very fast in a domain. Why young people goes to university? Because they have the foundation knowledge, they can switch over to any career. And we have to have a strong foundation knowledge, and that is STEM in my way, in different degree. I'm not saying exactly STEM in that way. Transversal skill, soft skill, that's another one. And third, you have to also get ready with the people with the coming new technical skill. So this is the mixing of balance of this. So our job is going to be very hard. That's no doubt I'm telling you. Earlier 20, you are telling me I'm almost 30 years in this, you know, Tibet indirectly, indirectly way. It was much more simple, our life. You prepare a learner for a single occupation with a training concept, give that competency, they are ready for labor market, and you are very sure about that. Okay, my job is done. Now, when we are teaching, we do not know what technology is going to come after three years. What I will teach, how I can prepare the learner, not for today, but for tomorrow, day after tomorrow. I think here, need our brilliant mind to act together. There are ways and there are means to do that. So to me, we have from the Univox side, there are a few examples, just to say in a positive way. It's really, I learned a lot from that. One is digital consumer to digital creators. Tibet school, not only Tibet, I'm talking of secondary schools. Google has given the prize. 13 years boy, become the digital creator, and they got a job in Google to get this app to be projected. In Tibet, it is also happening. Malaysia is a case study where they have integrated that one with the foundation skill. Challenge-based education, Technica has raised this issue. In, in this, uh, you know, Europe, I know that's the, another discussion we can do. In Canada, the portfolio, skill portfolio, that's not just for narrow skill, but wide range of skill. That's why their applied college is almost Almost university. Who said that is not a university, actually, to me? So that's, again, another one. Learning to learn skill and entrepreneurship and school innovation hub. There are a lot of experiments going on. I have just spelled a few of the things. I think our job is to get to know more and have a positive response to this change, and I'm damn sure it's, it's possible. Thank you, Shaman. Uh, I have a, a gift and advice for you. Mm. A gift, a bottle of water, <laughs> and, and the advice... This is wine. <laughs> no, and the advice, if you have structural problem in, in the area, then move ahead. And that would be mobility, in uh, addition to your points, right, right. the four points. Right. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, Shaman. Very inspiring um, explanation from your perspective. Uh, we still have a a uh, last round of, of uh, interventions from colleagues, and uh, again, I will be speaking in French uh, to uh, have Charles uh, presenting also his perspective. Uh, Charles, uh, ce qui est important. Charles, uh, what is um, important in this last intervention to show a concrete example on how your association will change? in order to respond to this challenge and how do you think you can contribute to the TVET system in Ivory Coast in order to guarantee its success? So two things, two aspects, but with a precise example. So how will you change things and how will you contribute to this change? Thank you. Thank you. I would like to ask whether we really have to change because I think that the private sector in Ivory Coast has already taken a decision, has already made its commitment because um, 
Um, we have already seen in Ivory Coast what we're discussing here. This is why the private sector is, without any reserve, committing to um, a professional reform, a reform of um, TVAT. And maybe here um, I need to focus on this area. It is clear that as a country um, and also an enterprise needs to grow and needs some um, soft skills for that. So it doesn't only help to have a technical competence or to leverage um, potential. It is also important to take into account in how far our environment has changed and not only the professional we we professionals are not the technicians for um tvet um it is important that people can benefit from their professional education and if the government um puts in place initiatives it is important that we um win some time because professionals work every day and um, they usually have an objective and something to produce. And in our case, the reform took quite some time. And we have initiated it n nine years uh, before. And we said we can't continue to train people as we're doing it. And for nine years, uh, we had discussions without any clear outcome. And we said, now this is all over. And I would also like to say that um, I'd like to thank the initiative for um, TVET, and they've identified uh, the difficulties in our reform. Um, the um, difficult points, the challenges, and um, then we put in place the sectorial, the sector plans in order to um, put in place all the decisions taken. And we selected the agricultural area. And unfortunately, here there was another initiative, uh, and they considered that this wasn't a contribution. So what I'd like to say is that um, this um, method um, is very well known in our coast because we were committed to a certain level and we wanted to focus on that. We need some support in order to reinforce our, to build capacities and the government needs to achieve its object objective because we're talking about disruptions that are already existing, but there may also be future disruptions, and we will have to face them. So if we're not ready for that, this is a real difficulty. So today, what I can say here is that the private sector will not change um, its perspective, but will commit itself to uh, help the government and the decision makers to put in place their um, theory. Um, um, I would say we will now have to accelerate. Uh, we don't have too much time to rest on our laurels because we have so many um, challenges to face. And when it comes to um, learning, we are committed to learning because in our case, in Ivory Coast, we have, for example, mechanics or um, we have carpenters, um, uh, but they haven't learned this formally. Um, and today we're trying to um, set up tests and um, legislation on apprenticeship. And this is exactly the spirit um, of this conference that is reflected there. And we're trying to put our plans in concrete actions. And to come to a conclusion, I would like to say that this forum um, has shown how we can support the public sector in order to accelerate.
with our technical and financial partners in order to come up with a meth method in order to achieve our objectives. So this is what I wanted to contribute at this level. Thank you very much, uh, Charles, Charles. I think that's very clear. So uh, you're um, appealing to um, building capacities. Will change if, if, if any changes and, and how you will contribute to the change. I don't really want to, this to take it to the organization World Skills Alliance. I will want to take it to the group that I represent, which is the youth. And then it's actually quite easy to answer that question. Because you can just look around this room and I'll ask you, do you realize something? Because I realized it as soon as I entered that room. And let's just say, you're all a little bit older than I am. And if I may just remind you what group we keep talking about, it's the youth. People who are my age and under my age who are in vocational education and training. So my questions to you are, where is my group? Why do you keep talking about us and not with us? Why do you exclude us from a discussion that is about our education and training? And why do you try to shape our future without us making a contribution? I invite you to answer all of these questions, but actually I just want you to think about it. And I want to make a suggestion that would, in my opinion, bring us a big step forward. Let the youth have a say. As for the future, whenever you go somewhere to represent your organizations, bring someone from your organization along, a young person. Invite young people to forums like this one who are in vocational education and training. Set up a panel with only young people. Invite the whole World Coast Champions Trust, because I have nine fellow champions who would be more than happy to make their contribution as well. And I don't think that it's my group who has to change. It's all of your stakeholder groups that have to change. And invite us to join this dialogue with you. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. But I said that in my presentation yesterday, we are watching you. <laughs> <laughs> That's not enough. <laughs> okay. Uh, we would like also to hear from, from Maria. What is your perspective on, on this? Um, yeah, so I think representing the youth group, um, it's actually important, um, contrary to what you've just said, um, that the youth also must step out of our comfort zone. So I think it's really... One example I can think about just on the top of my head um, is standardized tests. Um, so we're faced, before going to university, even just um, in, within our education, we're faced with so many standardized tests, and though no one really speaks up ever. And I think the thing is, there are so many opportunities out there for youth to actually speak up, but sometimes you're very, you're very kind of close-minded and don't really want to step out of your comfort zone and see what's out there. Um, and I think the biggest issue really is to realize that there are those disruptions out there, that the world is changing and that we need to do something about it because otherwise following that linear path isn't enough anymore. We need to be flexible and without really realizing that everything's changing, that's not going to be possible. Um, and I think another thing is really, I like to talk about that. Um, um, so we need to avoid falling into the default bias and just following what's being presented to us. Um, just being like, okay, um, I'm going to go to school for 10 years and then maybe do my Abitur if you're in Germany and then go to university just because it's being presented to you and because it's easy. You need to question whether that's actually the right proper choice for yourself. Um, and I think also the problem really is you don't know what you don't know. And I think what I like to always bring up is think about search engines um, or Facebook, Google. The result you're being presented with is that it's actually what you want to see. So I think that's just showing you that 
Um, because search engines always tailor your searching results to what you want to see. You're not going to be able to see outside of that kind of box. And I think just really stepping outside of the box and seeing what's out there is important for our, um, our stakeholder. However, support is needed. Um, and I think that support really needs to come from institutions, be it academic or TVET institutions. Um, because they need to ensure that we, um, we know what's out there and that they actually give us the knowledge. And I think throughout the entire forum, what we've been discussing is mutual learning. And I think mutual learning country to country is really important in that, to know what works and what doesn't work. What are some practices that maybe countries can adapt, that institutions can adapt, um, that have been helping young people. Um, also, as I've said before, making TVET more attractive and really saying that TVET is TVET that doesn't mean you're going to enroll in this institution and then you're going to have one job. However, if it's life learning, it means that you're going to de develop as well. And that, for, for example, you start off as a carpenter, but then at some point you, you can actually build your own company, that that's possible and that's not just you're enrolling and that's it. You know the, you know the end goal. That's not how TVIT works. Um, furthermore, just spreading awareness about the issue, spreading awareness about what TVIT actually means um, and the opportunity that opportunities that it provides is also very necessary. Um, and last but not least, produce TV that's relevant um, and that's going to make people feel as if, if they're going to enroll in it, they're going to be able to make a change and not just going to be um, doing something that they're doing because they failed academically. Yes. Thank you, Maria. Shaman, we, thank you. We are back to you to tell us a bit what, uh, what Univoc, and you, there was a lot of call on, on you, uh, but I would add the, the last call also from Jacqueline. Can you let us know what you will do, how you let the youth have a voice in Univoc network? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, before we come to the, your point, we are very happy all the time to get this, you know, uh, questions, and we are very much conscious about that. Um, first, I like to say from the Univoc network, Institution of the Univoc Nature, you will agree with me, are all confronting the realities of disruption. I can give you site one after another, migration, key issue in Europe, majority of the Univoc centers, directly or indirectly, are involved in the process. So it's a, they, have a, they have a mandate from the policy makers and others to deal with, and they are struggling. They're, they're looking for, you know, answer how to do that. Greening the same, and also you have the digital one. So to me, without going to the further detail, I will say that because we are facing this as a day-to-day -day reality, we have a high potential to be strategic resource in this journey. We need to think a little positively now. What is the strategic resources? The first thing, I think, breaking down the barriers. Just to a little bit uh, in the form of slogan I am giving, just to remind all of us what we mean by breaking down the, break, uh, the barriers. I think institution cannot work alone. Univox Center cannot work alone. Now, if Univox Center cannot work alone, what the Univox Center need to do when they are in the country or in a place, whatever in a, in a country? They need to tie up with the local ecosystems. You have got, got the global data. You have a little bit perception that what is going to be happen. Nothing. Please look at your soil, your country, your context, the local ecosystem. Try to connect with the skill demands people. Look at the research organization tied with the peer level institutions. See who is doing what and try to come up with a real, you know, breaking down the barrier. For that, we are working on a project. I like, I mean, we like to tell you one thing, that really the, the challenge will be on your table now. We really want to have few Univox Center, if it is more, I will be more than happy, to be a hub of this you know, concept and show to the world that this is the way it needs to be worked like innovation, at the same time breaking down the barrier, how we can formulate. I need all of your 
with uh, all of you in this journey. The second one, bridging the experiences. Bridging the experiences is our general concept, but we are coming up with a new project, which is called Building the Bridge Project. And one of the reasons you are here, you might say that Europe is also there, region is also there. The reason is, sometimes we have observed some of the region has something more to offer, other region at the receiving end. But at the same time, other region has something to offer, this vice versa, the, the way Bohin said, sender and receiver can be complex like this. And because all the countries are unique, this bridge needs to be formed. And more we do the bridge, I think more we will go to a, near to the reality and the real pictures. And I will encourage, let's form this bridge between the region through Univox centers to have a clear, you know, like a projects which can be shown some kind of results. And the third one, which you can also say that when you are talking of bridging or building, building the bridges, you need to showcase all of your things in our portal. We have a platform, promising practices, collaborative research, proposal driven capacity development, Yes, we have all these tools are in hand with you. So let's try to use maximum. We are trying, not that. You are all involved, but we need to really think more innovatively how we can scale up. The final one is building leader capacities. This is our flagship. What we have really sincerely can tell you that last three years, with all the experience that we have gathered, we have seen nothing will change if the proper leader being not in place. Given two countries, same, same funding, same ecosystem, same similar nature. It cannot be same in, a, in that way, but I'm talking of similar nature. One is quite advanced, another is lagging. And when we dissect the reason, we have seen leadership matters and matters most. And that's why our flagship program on leadership will integrate whatever discussion you have today we are doing will be integrated in our leadership program. One of the module will be how we can handle disruptions, this issue. Because it's a part of ongoing process and that we need to, uh, we need to carry upon. For me, we are very much confident that the way we are working with your help, support, we can achieve it. Concretely, you have seen brilliant project. One is return on investment, which is we have the tool in ready. Any Univox center in any country want to join in the project, please contact Phil and Ken for, for scaling up. Now the, we have the tool. You can, you can use it if you feel it. On migration, a conceptual base paper will be ready by this year, and we will share with you. The central figure is not general migration, migration and skill. Please, skill is our entry point, which we like to do on that. On entrepreneurship, mainstreaming entrepreneurial learning on Tibet teachers, I think uh, the, we have, like Technica is taking with Miki, uh, they are working together to work out on that. Greening community, that's the local. I think we are expecting CGAP. You have to take that in a higher plane so that local ecosystem and greening community where we can march, you have to take the lead role with Ken as a greening uh, champions. We will do that on that. We have all the already greening guide document ready, which is just for implementation. If you agree, implementation is needed. The way Canada has, you have presented five pillars. I think we need more spot in the world to show that we are on the same page. And last but not the least, teachers, which I think, Boreen, you rightly pointed out. I think ultimately teacher is the priority and somehow we don't have a clear, you know, vision we need to work out now, one on the digitization, on migration, everywhere the same issue is coming. So we will work together, 
I think uh, inter uh, there is an intersectorial you know, task force is working on that. We will do together. So a lot of things in our plate. But without you, we can't do anything. So let's, together, we will perform it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I suggest uh, to thank, first of all, the, the panelists. Thank you so much. And uh, I will uh, ask them to uh, take back their place in, uh, in the audience. We, we are moving to the, uh, to the last session. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we have... Uh, final two points that uh, we would like to thank. So thank you. We would like to thank you. First of all, uh, I would like to say that we, we will, uh, of course, the team here at uh, Univoc will be preparing uh, a report out of the, uh, the discussion and, and the, uh, the different uh, input that we have had. And that, of course, will be shared with all the participants. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm expected to uh, say a few words on the takeaway. And uh, it's very hard to do that, uh, um, um, I mean, uh, in, in such a short time. But, but I think uh, I would like to pick up four points that seems to me very important in our discussion today and, and yesterday. One uh, is, uh, first of all, uh, thinking about the, uh, the learning pathways and, and uh, positioning the learning pathways in lifelong learning. Uh, I think uh, it's important that we don't focus only on the systems, but also on individuals and how the individuals are supported to take forward their, their learning process and, and their, uh, in, enhance their ca capability. But to do so, to be able to support learning pathways in lifelong learning, first of all, you need to understand what is changing what is the demand? How the demand is changing? And that's part of the capacity to anticipate that demand. Uh, the disruption, uh, and uh, Sean was referring, there is disruption happening now, but there are forthcoming disruption. So the capacity to understand the demand, to uh, anticipate this demand, and uh, to hear the voice of youth, as Jacqueline was referring to, uh, is, is very important, and, and have them have a say about the future uh, seems to me uh, something very important. The second point that is... Uh, uh, important is about uh, the learning process. If we build system without thinking about the teaching and learning process, w what pedagogy is, is, is used, how to develop the capacity of teachers to uh, support the learning pathways, uh, then we'll, we'll fail in ensuring that people have opportunities that are worth to take. The third element that uh, is important is how to recognize and value those learning. Is if we are offering people learning opportunities w without being able to recognize their learning in formal setting, in non-formal, in, fo in informal, in the workplace, in life, and value those learning, we, we will, will fail in supporting those learning pathways. And the last point is what we were discussing earlier when Manuela was, was facilitating, is how we know that we are doing well. What are the evidence? We have to support our thinking, our strategies, our development with hard evidence, with supported evidence. And evidence are not necessarily only quantitative. They can be also qualitative. They can be the combination. But we need evidence of, of success. We need evidence of support. And that, uh, of course, requires uh, a, a governance model that, that's, that involves the different stakeholders. We have been, of course, supporting the uh, contribution of the private sector. But we have to think also about the union, and, and Srinivas will not contradict me, that the, the uh, social dialogue is not one voice. It's also the voice of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the union. But increasingly, we have to in involve other stakeholders. For example, youth organization, youth association that can represent the future and have the voice of, of youth association. So that governance model has to evolve with the disruption and it cannot remain as, as it used to be first uh, only government driven or uh, even with the social partners. It has to involve the communities, it has to involve uh, youth uh, organization as well. So I think that those are elements that are coming from our discussion. Not all of them uh, we have uh, addressed deeply but, but they came in, in, our, in our thinking and of course uh, this back to the Univoc network and uh, to uh, UNESCO to, to support this. In any case, 
as part of the UNESCO strategy, uh, one of the pillars is to support transitions mm -hmm. in, in member states, and disruption will require transitions and will, will uh, trigger transition. And we hope that through our activities in partnership with, uh, with other organizations, uh, the interagency group where ILO, OECD, uh, European Commission, uh, the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, etc., are part. We, we can we can collaboratively support uh, member states in this transition. But obviously, uh, the the setting here is about Univoc network, and that's the engine that can support international cooperation, that can support collaboration, that can support solidarity. Because we are we are in a difficult moment, and it's not sufficient uh, to be competing. It's also important to be uh, solid there. With those words, I would like to give you back the floor, Shemal, to tell us a bit how we are finishing this uh, celebration and this uh, uh, festival of discussion. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we would like to also to, to know uh, from you where we are moving from this event. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, I think we have to wrap up a little quickly. I know some of you have to also catch up your train or plane. So um, at the outset, uh, I think I'd like to thank each and every one for you in particular for taking up uh, your busy schedule and so much engage in the discussion. I have observed right from the session to the plenary, there was a deep involvement and this really inspired us. And I really like to thank the delegates who have been on the webcast, I think, I, I have, uh, we didn't get the figure yet, but not only this has been, you are the audience, worldwide it has been uh, webcast, so many people have observed that, and that way we are reaching out those who cannot uh, able to came here. So I'd like to thank them, those who are tuned with the webcast. Although we are uh, discussing about disruptions, but we are, one way is a very fortunate, you know, there was a prediction that in Bonn, coming two days, last two days, will be very rainy and gloomy weather. I think finally God and heaven has decided, this is a hard-working people. Please give them a good stay here. <laughs> so my request will be, Bonn is a green city. Yesterday I told in, in the city, you have seen that how we define Bonn. Bonn is a really a good green city. You have today evening, don't waste no more time. Just take out and go try to see a little bit outside, I will say, to see the Bonn. Really, you will enjoy. It's a, it's a very nice harmony between nature and the people. Appreciation, uh, in a say, first, definitely, you, but the host country. They have supported, you have seen from the, from the opening to the last. And this is a, all the organization. I don't like to mention only one or two. I will say that as a host country, government of Germany has given the full support with all the ministries, all the organs that is possible. We are extremely, extremely grateful for the support. We have a national commission here. I like to convey that you can convey this message to all that how much we value the you know, support. And thank you very much for the, all the discussions. I don't want to repeat. And you know that the six projects that we are now undertaking in everywhere without you, nothing will be continued. So really, we want your uh, more engagement and more participant to that. Just to let you know that everything has been packaged in UNESCO Univoc with a strategy. That is medium term strategy too. Those who have a copy, you know it, but those who do not have the copy, please collect the copy. You will get the full hour, the way of working. In the MTS2, one of the cardinal point is how we are dealing with transition. And we clearly say it in the third pillar, it is like uh, you know digital transition and the greening transition we are talking about. Actually, we are unpacking all this thing in more detail here, in a sense, what exactly we are going to do. There are three priorities and four programs intervention. Four, I like to all Univox centers, especially,
to remind like this is our Bible for three years. So the first pillar is developing capacity of the leaders, Tibet leaders. So this is our first work that we are doing. UNESCO Tibet Leadership Program is our flagship program. Those who have attended, you can hear from them. And we like to really continue that. And I like to thank that this will be our major and all this thing will be included. But we don't just do the leadership program. We support the leaders to transform the institution. Here is the difference between many, you know, uh, capacity development project and our project here. So they have to come up with a proposal, have to understand the re real local issues, make a proposal. If it is discussed and put forward, then we started supporting them so that it can be implemented, and then we can monitor one by one how we. While it will be supporting role will come in as a leaders and institution, we will generate new knowledge by that time. So here you have seen a lot of new knowledge need to be developed. Some are ongoing, some we have not yet, we don't know and we have not yet started. Like talking anticipation of skill is so easy, but when you go to the whole process, it will be quite difficult process that we need to check in. What are the ways we have to do? So that's why we have to generate collectively new knowledge. And that will be our strength. And the fourth one, we have to really strengthen our networking. Because if we don't work together, and I am telling you from my heart, you know, sometimes it disappoints me a little bit when I see a country only saying their story, not looking at the other story and coming together to change that. I think in UNESCO Univoc, that's the, I say it is a family. We feel like a, no, we are part of a one global family, and we like to see more Univox centers come together. And I am very proud to tell you that we are a quite a bit advanced now because the connection between the b different Univox centers working together is like a you know, lifeline of our progress that is happening. We need to continue that seriously and help each other in a way so that we can do. I like to thank all the Univox centers, those who have come, International Agency, World Skills um, is a partner. And to echo your question, you know, from 2011, when I visited Leipzig to attend your World Skills program, that was an eye opener for me about the youth engagement and skills. And from 2011 to today, we are integral part of World Skills now in that way. And you, we, we sincerely want to promote the youth. And all these things we are bringing you here. And UNESCO has a special program on youth forum, which organized before the general conference. Only youth. I will say that's also wonderful. Three days event, usually have to give it. So, but we need to really engage, and that's a very good point that you have raised. And... I think I have covered appreciation to all, but not uh, last, but not the least. My sis this is my sincere appreciation go to our committed Univoc team. This Univoc teams and volunteers. <laughs> I feel really honored when I last, uh, when I do, like, uh, we are very small, you know, we are not a big organization. But even if we are small, we are a very beautiful team. The coordinations are so fantastic. You have seen that. And they have done it. A good blend, like I say, foundation skill, transversal skill. This is theoretical, but I see a good mixture of matured, young, interns, volunteers starting from age to 18 to we have 50 years. I think that's really a wonderful way of changing the, our thinking. Have a safe journey back home and stay in touch. And finally, remember my word, we shall overcome.